Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Welcome and thank you again for joining us for another episode. Thank you on whatever platform you're listening on, wherever you're listening on. Thank you very much for for tuning in to this episode. So I'm really excited for this topic and I think if all things go well, this will be the beginning of a little bit of a chronological series to, to follow this coach's journey as he is starting his journey coaching in a middle school program. And so the hope for this is that coaches, whether they're new or whether they're veteran coaches, can kind of go on this journey with this coach. And and if you're an older coach, you can think about what it was like when you first started. And if you're a newer coach or you're a brand new coach, you can sort of be on this journey with this coach together as we try and get through this basketball season and and do the absolute best that we can. So we're going to go on this journey uh, with Coach uh, Billy Joe Nix. Coach, how are you today? I'm doing great. Great. And like I said, I'm excited and thankful that you're willing to kind of open yourself up about your thought process as you go about starting this first year on this new journey and building the program and and implementing the ideas that you want to implement. I think that it's a really, really cool insight that we're going to be able to get into. And and like I said, for some of us to reflect on when we first started and then for the newer ones to, you know, kind of go on that journey with you. So let's Before we even get into that part of the journey, let's go back to where you've been. So, Coach, uh, where has basketball taken you? Where has your previous experience with other forms of coaching taken you? Uh, Where have you been and where are you at right now? Um, Well, uh, I uh, live in a small town, Avon, Illinois. It's uh, in western Illinois. Um, Basically, my coaching experience up until this point has been involved with some of the travel ball. that's been it's not necessarily affiliated with the school but it is like a school you know school teams so I started off um I my son got interested in it when he was probably in about third or fourth grade um and so I was kind of at that time I hadn't really played a lot in a long time so I was kind of away from the game for a little bit um but then he started really really getting into it and dad I want to go out and shoot dad I want to go out and shoot uh, by the time he was in fourth grade, I started getting into it again, and that kind of got me re-energized, revitalized, and uh, rekindled my passion for the game. Um, and then he went on and played uh, for a number of years. Um, his fifth grade year, I was actually fortunate enough to be allowed to be an assistant on that team. So that was my first time coaching um, or being a part of – I was more of an instructional role. Like I did a lot of one-on-one with some of the players. Um, I wanted to be prepared though. So I went ahead and looked at what do I need to do to prepare? Um, I went on to the Illinois High School Sports Association website and looked at what certifications the coaches need. I'm not a teacher. So uh, I went ahead and I took all the training courses I had to get certified through IHSA and IESA, which is of course the elementary school. Mm -hmm. Um, And also all the National Federation of High School courses because I wanted to be as knowledgeable as I could. and then I also actually went through, and I highly recommend for new coaches, is to go to USA Basketball, um, yeah. USAB uh, Youth. Just look it up. And they have a licensing process through there. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really good inform, information, um, really good when you're dealing with younger kids um, and learning about the skill development stuff and what you need to coach for kids at a certain skill level rather than the age. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took all that certification and all the training I did. I went there with that knowledge. Um, I think I spent way too many nights up watching film. (laughs) Uh, Even though I was getting ready to be like help with a fifth grade team, I wanted to know everything that I possibly could. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think I learned too much tactically or technically coaching there, but I did learn a lot about building culture um, with with the coaches. Guys were pretty knowledgeable, but they were really great. Um, honorable guys and they were good role models so that kind of set the tone okay 
that's kind of how I want to be as a coach. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I kind of sat on the on the uh, end of the bench. I did a lot of um, ch shot charting, um, sh uh, charting the shots, uh, giving the coach like free throw and shooting percentages and things like that, so he could adjust things. So it was a really good learning experience. Uh, the next year, I coached my girls, um, my daughter's third and fourth grade travel team, which was an experience. It was my first time as a head coach, um, I had another guy with me that was one of the dads, and he wasn't really that experienced like me, loved basketball, uh, had a daughter on the team, so um, learned a lot of uh, things, made some mistakes, um, things you, you wish you could go back and correct, you know, what I know now. Yeah. Um, but did that for a year, and then I uh, applied for a position um, at Unity Middle School, and it's in Menden, Illinois. Uh, which is again in Western Illinois. It's near the biggest city is Quincy. Um, and they, I had actually had my eye on that program for a couple of years. And when a position opened up, I applied and I was so lucky to get the job. Well, you've had, like, and it's, I'm glad that you mentioned this, that, that you do have some background of coaching. You do have a little bit of experience. And, and I really like that you kind of mentioned like what got you interested and what got you excited about it with, with having um, with having a kid and then kind of once that re-energized you, you kind of went all in. <laughs> you kind of went all in with the uh, with, with learning and, and being up to date with like certificates and training and things like that. And I think that um, I think that's kind of the right approach if if you're really serious about it and you want to get get invested to you know seek out all those resources you can because i'm sure you can attest to this there's almost a limitless amount of resources to, to find out there if you want to get better at coaching right absolutely and as somebody who played high school basketball in the 90s the game is different mm -hmm. you know more um and i think there's more information out there that's available yeah i don't think i knew where a basketball camp was <laughs> growing up uh, you know and if there was one it was probably like the one rich kid in school could go mm -hmm. and it was probably like five hours away um mm -hmm. there's just so much more resources out there if you just look um but it's also good to get make sure you get good knowledgeable verified resources yeah yeah there, there's so many people who have a youtube channel or have things up on social media and i know for some people it could be like really overwhelming like where to start but what you said is a good point you know find you know kind of verified resources find things that are more official and don't allow yourself to get too overwhelmed by everything and, and try and figure out your identity and figure out what's important to you so i'm glad that you mentioned that um before we get into uh, our topic. Uh, I want to specifically mention about your experience uh, with coaching younger ages, and, and you also have experience. Uh, you mentioned about like kindergarten through second grade, like really young. What what is what's that like? As as somebody who doesn't really know about coaching, like anyone at that level, what what are the skills that you learn that you think you might be able to even apply at this new middle school job by coaching? Uh, individuals that were at such a young age like that um i think you get more out of it as a coach than the kids get out of it as players um depends right there so there are some kids uh that i see now one guy, a kid in particular that i remember him as a kindergartner and i've seen him as a fifth grader and that kid is locked in and he was locked in the very first day yeah you know and you can kind of tell you like okay this kid is going to be a ball player um, but honestly, it's, it's, it's really, it's pure joy. It's getting to see kids hit their first basket, mm -hmm. even if it's only on that little six foot basket, you know, and then you got the junior size ball. It's like the 26 and a half inch basketball. Um, but they're, they're learning, they're learning a lot of the basics things, you know, they're, of course, they're going to travel and of course they're going to double and they're going to just run around. They're going to foul each other heavily. Um, but it's just getting on the court and, and trying to, it's more about corralling them, honestly, um, <laughs> pointing them in a direction um, and doing the absolute bare minimum basics. So we are going to dribble, we are going to pass, and we are going to shoot. Um, I'd never really worry too much about form with them, obviously, because it's just, you know, getting the ball 
you know, maybe, maybe don't start with the, sh with the ball behind your head, you know, getting them to, to put it up in front of them. Um, they don't have a lot of upper body strength, of course, uh, even on the smaller hoops. So if they use two hands, I'm not too worried about that. Um, teaching them how to play defense, um, you know, uh, closing. I have actually worked on them with closing out and stuff like that. And I think the biggest thing for me was teaching kids triple threat. Um, uh, yeah. Because that's, to me, that is the basis of all, all offensive basketball. Um, and trying to get them to get it and it helps calm them down too because they don't they don't like jump up and down and you know whoa you get them and say okay get the ball put it on your hip now what are you going to do so um, and really looking for games um, that like we talked about there's a lot of resources out there sharks and minnows um, you know have them play like knockout um, things like that get them get them to really enjoy the game of basketball and the main thing I think my job was is to keep them safe, number one, because they will run around um, and to let them uh, enjoy the game. Yeah. Uh, one time I actually looked around and half my team was gone and I couldn't figure out what was happening. And I looked around and there was a little boy on the court who was kissing my daughter who was on the team. <laughs> oh, so, needless to say, I, I, I picked him up and I was like, oh, we're not going to do that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, his mom <laughs> It was it was funny. I mean, it was innocent, but uh, yeah. you're gonna have those, you're gonna have those moments. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was it was fun. Um, now, as they get a little bit older, obviously, so kindergarten the way our school does it, the program um, does it. Uh, it's kindergarten and first graders. Um, I'm sorry, kindergartners are are one team, and then first and second graders are together um, on another group. And then they second grader they have like the the backboard you can just like attach to a hoop and it's like an eight foot um so we don't really do i mean again they don't really call traveling that much or anything like that but then i try to structure a little bit more um you know introducing like running yeah drills yeah uh, little little things like that um getting them to enjoy that like we would run back and forth but we would do like silly you know make a silly walk or make a silly <laughs> run Get them, get them used to like loving the physical activity, uh, and it was it was really fun. I myself personally was a little disappointed that at second grade they were keeping score. Mm, um, yeah, I, I I get why they did it, but to me it's like every kid travels on every single possession. Uh, the score is zero to zero <laughs> if we're going to yeah. rules, but you know some kids would would. Um, would uh, get a little down by that but you know what then another kid would get make their first basket and they would all get hyped and they would forget about it and it's it's really 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 important to have a lot of energy and and be fun and have a sense of humor about everything and right. then they so well yeah to emphasize a couple of things that that you said i think it's so important that that it's fun for them especially because it's probably going to be like some of their first experiences ever with basketball and you want to leave them with positive like fun impression of the game so that they keep coming back to playing it and also understanding which which you definitely uh, see, seem to emphasize as well is that their those attention spans are super short you got to keep them engaged in different things and you know doing games and doing little things like that you're not going to hold their attention for long and i think it blows my mind too that they kept, they kept score at second grade i, I think i don't know how you feel but i, I feel mm -hmm. like not only is it just going to be zero zero, but I think it's it's already like making it way more competitive than it needs to be for a, for an eight year old. And I don't know. Oh. Yeah, that's that was my thought, and I mean, I was, I, but here as a volunteer coach in an organization, you just kind of go with what yep. you do. Yeah, I told them at the end of every game, it's like I don't care about that. We don't care about that. And I told them, this is why this doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. like, all the things that you put in your best effort. So, mm -hmm. Well, that, that, that does make sense in the sense that, like, if you're a volunteer coach, you know, you're going to just adhere to the system that, that you're in, and you're going to make the best of it, and then take what you will from it, and, and you did, and now you're going to kind of be moving on to your program now at, at this middle school. And so now that you are – beginning this journey as as your first year coach here at unity what are your 
what are your plans? What's, what's kind of like your course of action so that this program is going to be built the way that you want it to be built? Well, I think, first of all, whenever you go into a program, your first thought, at least mine, and my, because I actually sat down and I developed a, a coaching philosophy. When I came down for this job, I wrote, what do I know about basketball? Just I wrote everything out. And then I said, what do I need to know? Right. Um, and then I developed an actual coaching philosophy. So I researched online. I thought about what are my core principles of the game of basketball? What are the most meaningful things to me? And I think number one, um, outside of obviously player safety and things like that, is the culture of the team. Um, mm -hmm. Make sure that it's a positive culture. Make sure that it's, you know, we're rooting for everybody on the team, whether we're on the bench or on the, on the, on the court. Um, I very much believe, you know, everybody plays, but playing time isn't equal at this level because I'm more about development. But I was very fortunate to get this job. Um, yeah. A little bit about the school is uh, they've had a coach that was there for 10 years. Okay. Um, he had a couple different assistants um, throughout the years, but during that course of time, they won, uh, I think it's something like five state championships between the seventh and eighth grade level. And they wow. also finished second or were in the playoffs several times. Um, they've had a pretty successful high school girls basketball team too. Um, so I knew that when I went there, that the culture's there. Um, the the other guy that's coaching with me, I don't call him my assistant. I'm the eighth grade coach. He's the seventh grade, but we're co-coaches. Mm -hmm. um, he has been involved in the travel program um, for like the coaching like third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade girls for a number of years too. So he knows these girls. He knows the program. Um, we're, we're on that same level. We both have an extreme passion for the game of basketball. Um, so I knew that right away that, okay, that one is I can already check that off my list. Um, I, I looked at everything. I said, so what, are, what am I walking into exactly? Because you kind of look at, okay, what have they done in the past? I reached out to the previous coaches. Fortunately, the previous coaches that were there, um, it was an amicable thing. One, one coach, uh, she, she's actually uh, taking the time off because she has a younger daughter and her oldest daughter is playing college ball. Um, and oh, she okay. actually – she actually played pro ball overseas. So she knows what she's talking about <laughs> Yeah. on her. I said, Hey, what do you know? Tell me everything. And she's just spelling all this information. And I'm just like, this is the great, you know, um, the previous head coach, she sent me like stats and things like that. So I got to take a look at the stats and, and see, you know, what's what, what's what. So I wanted to know about the players and who is coming back, what the numbers have looked like. Um, you know, with smaller schools and, and rural communities, sometimes participation is an issue. Um, we're not going to have that many eighth grade girls this year, but we have, um, basically, it's going to be one team. Okay. So I'm going to have a lot of girls that are going to be pulling double duty. Um, I talked with a high school coach and found out what they're doing at their levels. Um, I said, hey, what do, you look, what do you look for? What kind of stuff do you run? Um, I'm not going to overload them with the same amount of plays and things like that that they do. I believe very passionately in the read and react system, which I know it's a very popular thing. Yep. I had even before I started with my um, with my son's team, I'd found uh, Rick Torbett uh, from Better Basketball. Uh, and if anybody is interested in positionless basketball, that's the place to go. Yeah, I'm really the man for that. <laughs> so, and he's actually, in, and I was really encouraged, like I said, when I talked with the coach, with the, uh, it was the athletic director and the JV girls basketball coach who was going to be the principal and the superintendent. Um, and when I talked with them and I started talking about the, the position of basketball and the systems they use, they said, yeah, we utilize that. And I was just like, oh, this is, this is a match made in heaven. Right. So I'm just, I'm so as long with the culture, then, you know, I know that what I've got built into that. So then I start looking at my tactical stuff. Um, and I just kind of decided, I looked at the numbers, I believe in the system. So I just said, well, we're going to do, I'm going to come up with a four out, a five out and a three out. Um, and then run little sets off of that. So I kind of developed the plans. I went on to, uh, I found like a, drawing system to where I could draw the plays. It's like play pro art or something of that nature. Okay. Actually drew out the plans, sent them to the other coach, said, hey, this is kind of what I'm thinking. 
so he said, yeah, it's like a lot of this stuff will work. They know how to do this. They know how to do that. Um, now this is all obviously, you know, the big elephant in the room is the COVID thing. So I don't have time to meet with them. Um, I, I didn't have a chance to, to um, interact with them yet. So obviously we're still waiting for guidelines and stuff like that from the state of Illinois to when, if we are allowed to do off season stuff at the um, junior high level yet. Um, so a lot of this is just kind of secondary and tertiary things. I created a Facebook page uh, for the team, invited all the parents, uh, share info on there. I, w I wanted to establish that communication. Um, I can't really, you know, at this time, can't really like share like plays and coach them up, so to say. Yeah. But I, I know that uh, from what I've talked with the other coaches and stuff that this is going to be something that should be a fairly smooth transition. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, it's for this point, it's just kind of like wait and see. Um, I know that um, I have gotten some practice plans developed right now, but I'm kind of looking off of what the previous season schedule was when the expected start day of practices are. Right. What I want to accomplish. Um, I want to make it uh, definitely throw in some skills, some skills and drills days to where we're not just 100% working on tactics and stuff like that. Um, and I think that's one of the lessons I learned from even coaching with the younger kids is you got to be able to dedicate some time to just developing skills. Yeah, um, especially, absolutely. This, especially at this level, you can get so caught up in, in tac tactics and game planning and things like that, that you just kind of lose sight of uh, sight of that sometimes I think. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, it's really, it's really kind of a something that's already preset there. There's a lot of support. Um, the parents are great. The booster club is great. Uh, the administration is great. It's 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 kind of a ready-made situation. Yeah. Um, I really have didn't have to like stoke the fire or anything. Um, I think the only thing is is I'm proud of this. Okay. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking like, what am I going to do to make sure that this is a a hustle culture? Because that's what I love. You know, I love hustle players. Yep. So I'm getting a. A, an actually like a, a wrestling belt designed um, and through a website and you it's going to be miss hustle so they're going to have to battle it out in practices and games and every week there's going to be like a championship battle and whoever is like the hustle player is going to win. <laughs> so that, one of the things as i was thinking about is how do i how do i you know kind of leave my mark on this and i want them to be a hard hustling you know defensive based you know, fast paced team. So, mm -hmm. um, so I came up with that idea. Yeah. Um, love it. So that's, go kind of, that's kind of where I'm at right now. So uh, I'm curious, uh, because your, your situation that you're inheriting is, is pretty unique in the sense that you're inheriting a program that has not only a track record of success, but there's a lot of foundations that have already been set, like you said, with parent involvement and, and, the fact that you work with a coach who who already knows uh, some of the girls who are coming up. So did you feel or are you feeling the sense of like, I'm not going to change a lot because if it's not broke, I'm not, uh, there's no need to fix it versus you mentioned the hustle thing, but also like versus, you know, there are ideas or there are things that I think can change and, and be improved upon to kind of get this program like even further than it already is like what was that kind of thought process for you well i'm there are some girls that it seems to be like i i don't want to get anybody mired in the post i am like with positionless basketball you got to be willing to you know fall on that and say i want this girl who's normally pubs to be out here to try to dribble the ball in and score mm -hmm. you know because I want her to develop because there's like in particular one girl is on the team. They say, Oh, she's a great post player. I uh, look, she got a hundred offensive rebounds last season. Um, that's even with a couple games where the stats weren't kept up. So who knows how many she got total in the season, which is pretty impressive for a seventh grader. Um, and, but I want her to also be able to, to attack the rim, you know, from different angles. Maybe she's not going to attack it from the three point line. Maybe she's only going to attack it from, 
the from the free throw line or whatever. Yeah. So there are things that I don't want them to get settled into because my job is to develop them as players, I think, more so at this level and let the high school, especially varsity, worry about winning and putting them in certain certain positions. Yeah. Yep. So there well, that's that's definitely one thing I'm I've talked about with the with the director with the athletic director and everybody. It's like we're gonna we're gonna do work on development. So well it's it's really I think a, a good idea in general to be considering positionless basketball at the middle school level because you also don't know about the girls and they're going to grow or when they go into high school, like their role and in, in might be a lot different. And, and so to make sure that they're kind of skilled in different areas because, you know, the girl that's the post player in seventh grade um, may not be the post player when they get into high school. So I think that it seems like that's something too that you're also taking into consideration as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's definitely because I've seen that happen firsthand. Um, yeah. Guys that were uh, myself, I was, uh, you know, a six foot, I guess I was a four um in old school basketball you know but we because we didn't have much height yeah later on I, I played some ball after high school nothing like college or anything just like intramurals and, and tournament stuff i yeah. was actually in the air force for a number of years and there's a lot of athletes that are in the military um and the first time a guy jumped over my head and dunked on me i realized i was not a post player anymore <laughs> Oh, Even man. if it was just for like a recreational, you know, kind of a thing, it's like, okay, well, I need to play in a different spot. Mm -hmm. So I had to develop. I had to learn how to handle the ball better and how to shoot better so I could be on a team and actually help them. Right. Um, and I don't want change. Yeah, because um, I, I don't want the, I don't want the, their coach to have to spend the time to, to do those things, you know, at the high school level. I can expect that to happen also at the JV level a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, but, you know, it starts to, when you get to high school, yes, we want to develop them. Yes, we want them to enjoy their their school experience because it, interscholastic sports are an extension of the classroom, uh, which I think is a verbatim quote from the NFHS, like, training. Sounds um, like it, yeah. <laughs> but, it, I mean, it truly is. I really yep, do believe absolutely. It. But we want to instill at some point in time winning does have to matter. And I want them to be ready and willing um, and able to contribute. Well, you brought up a, a really good point in that, you know, this idea of like, of winning. And, and I think in general, just competing and having some sort of, you know, pride in, in competing in that, you know, I, I coached middle school for six years and, and at the end of the day, you know, wins and losses maybe weren't necessarily that big of a deal, but I wanted my girls or my boys when I coached them, I wanted it to matter to them if they won. I wanted it to, to matter to them if they lost, just from a sense of like competition to just have like some, some sort of pride, <laughs> so to speak. And, and, and you're right, like we don't want to get so fixated on it. But at the same, at the same point, I, I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong in, in putting words in your mouth, that it should matter. There should be some sort of feeling of wanting to compete, even at the middle school level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, that's that's a, because this is my thing is we're the coaches for a short limit of time, especially in the middle school. Yeah. Um, you know, if they go on to play high school, then that coach is going to be with them for four years. Um, and maybe to go on to college, luck, you know, if they're lucky. Um, but we only have them for a short period of time. This is their squad. This right. is this group of girls that they're playing with. This is their team. I, I'm never going to you know, openly say that <laughs> uh, <laughs> this, yeah. I'm the coach, I'm in charge, but this is truly their team. This is their squad. This is the group of girls that they're going to sit around when they're hopefully, you know, later on in life and they have their own daughters and they coach and they remember about the things that their squad did and their things that, um, that's, they go, I want them to take pride in that and remember the good and, and learn the lessons from the bad. Yeah. So failure is only a way to, it's only a, an opportunity to learn something. So, right. Yeah. I don't, I don't want it to sting them so emotionally that they're so upset. Um, but I do know I will have girls that will be like that. Cause I know I have some very, very competitive girls on the squad. Mm -hmm. um, there, there will be some that probably will take it to heart and I'll, I'll have to deal with that when that happens. But I also want them to like draw, uh, derive such, such pride um, uh, from winning. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense to me. And it actually is a great transition into my next question, uh, which is something that I know I talked about with Coach Haskins on, on the episode when I interviewed him. So if you're listening and didn't listen to that one, make sure you do. But one of the things he mentioned, and one of the things you mentioned as well, is that your belief, um, especially as a middle school coach, is that you're not going to sacrifice development just to get a win on the scoreboard. And, and that makes perfect sense. But to you, why is that important to you? But also, what are some situations that you think might come up where you are going to prioritize a player's development over necessarily getting a win? Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to mention uh, Coach Haskins. I had listened to that, and I just pretty much dittoed everything he said. So, <laughs> so that, was, that was a really great episode. Um, I think the way that – Every state's a little bit different, right? The way that IHSA and IESA works, you pretty much have your regular season games. Um, usually you have a, a county or, or conference tournament at some point in time in there. And then at the end of the season, everybody like goes to regionals. Um, based on your season, the IESA seed you and who you play and everything like this. So to me, those tournaments and the regionals are winning time, right? Yeah. The season I'm willing to play with a little bit more. Now there's a couple of teams in there that specifically that we have our rivals as a school that we really do want to beat, right? Yep. But by making these girls have ownership in this team and let you know that this should, you know, this is their squad, trying to build that ownership in their team, they will be more willing to be like, okay, I know I'm gonna sit down, but she's gonna go out there and she's gonna get a bucket. But there's gonna be a situation where we may be close and maybe the girl that hasn't played um an immense amount of minutes I'm going to put in yeah let her be in that pressure situation because later on down the road in school ball kids move kids get hurt uh they become academically ineligible mm -hmm. um you know right now unfortunately we're dealing again with the time kids might get sick um yeah. you never know when you're going to need that that 12th player on your bench to do yeah. something you just had them sitting there uh the whole time um on the bench not doing anything they're never gonna they're not gonna feel comfortable they're gonna go out there and the main thing is development and putting them in those situations so i think the number one trait you have to develop is confidence mm. i've seen so many great players that have such great potential but they just weren't confident right yeah that saying you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take and then i mean that's absolutely true um I'm not saying I want to get somebody who can't hit a free throw to be shooting from half court or anything. Like that. <laughs> right. Um, but I do want them to 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 put them in situations because and if they and if they fail, then we talk about it. But mm. if they make, but if they succeed, there you go. Um, and from talking with uh, some of the previous coaches and stuff, there's been some players on there that maybe haven't played as much, but the team like really came together they wanted to get this player a basket you know and that's the that's the great kind of things because that also develops character mm -hmm. um so i'm more willing right now with the way the season and everything is structured to take those risks during the regular season game um obviously there's gonna there's gonna be some times here with this group of girls that we're gonna be just beating teams up bad uh, yeah because they do have a pretty high skill level and it's kind of uh, you never know what you're going to get uh, as far as the conference goes. So there's there's teams that they've they've beat by 50 plus points, mm. um, <laughs> and that's the time to get experience for maybe some of the girls that haven't had all the time in the world. So yeah, very true. So do you think with that philosophy and uh, is that You've kind of alluded to this. Uh, I think you were getting there with, with that answer. Is this, do you think, going to be a shift that you're going to have to make with this group where, where you're going to tell them that, like, hey, like, we're going to do things a little bit differently and that we, we're going to be developing people more? And, and like you said, especially in the regular season. Or is this something that is already consistent from previous coaches that, that were at Unity? That's something I don't really know to be honest with you. And that's something that I'm still prepared. That is, that is a sort I'm, I'm prepared to. Yeah. Um, okay. I think what I'm, what I'm going to do is, is rather than doing like, okay, we're going to, I don't like the five in five out kind of subbing thing. Right. The platooning. Yeah. There's, right. So there's going to be a, a group of girls that 
all right, these are going to be my ball handlers. You're always going to have, you have to have skilled, competent players in certain positions on the court to mm -hmm. kind of help compensate. Right. Um, right. I don't want somebody cause I, you're going to do that anyways. Maybe you have a weaker perimeter defender. So you're going to have to know that you're going to need a really strong post player. That's going to be able to step up with the help defense and get rebounds and things like this. Um, so it's, it's more along the lines of putting them out there with the, with the other people, maybe playing around with the lineups a little bit too, and seeing like what works because sometimes there are certain situations where, Hey, I need this. I need, you know, I need to score this many points or I need to get a, a lockdown defense. I need to get some, get the ball back, you know, um, yeah. I need really great ball handlers. I need all my ball, great ball handlers on the court um, because they're really pressing us. So you don't really know what that is unless until you throw everybody out there and see how they actually react in a game. Because sometimes the kids can surprise you. Yep. They can practice. They can be kind of unsure of themselves, and they get there. The adrenaline gets going, and they and they just they they flip mm -hmm. a switch. Because there are those players that takes it takes harder to like motivate them to like get up for it and practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, that yeah, that's really true. You kind of never know, and that's kind of one of the things about beginning your journey is at a new school any coach who starts starts at a new school is there's things that you just really don't know until you see them for the first time or you just see what they're like in practice or building those relationships with them and then you can really start to to make some progress like oh okay well now that i've seen you now this picture is a lot clearer than than maybe it was before and uh when it's just kind of in that theoretical sense which is kind of what we're in right now exactly. and that and so with that, I know you don't really know because you're not quite sure as to, you know, that philosophy of sacrificing development for wins. Um, are there things that you are have in place or that you're going to be putting in place in terms of like the communication with parents in case parents are like, this isn't what things were like before and, and things like that? Is, is there like a plan that you, you have in place of how you want to make sure you're communicating effectively with parents? Yeah, so obviously, that, again, depends on school and everything like this but yep. I, I need to have like uh basically a written out policy that i'm going to share with the parents have a parents meeting uh, i've been very open about here's my here's my email here's my facebook um here's my phone number and everything like this now and that's going to continue to be um available to them i know i'm going to come across somebody that's disgruntled um that's going to happen uh, i mean i've seen it in like you know fourth and fifth grade I've seen like, you know, you've seen it too. So why is somebody think that their great basketball game? Um, but it's, it's pretty much going to be, I, I will make myself available as much as I possibly can always be willing to kind of give them feedback too. Uh, that's something I did with the group of girls that I had is, Hey, your daughter's doing this or your daughter's doing that kind of letting them know what they're doing in practice or what they're not doing, kind of telling them, Hey, they need to work on this or they need to work on that. So I think if I have that open communication with the parents, at least I hope so, and give them like constant feedback, um, then maybe that will that will bring about more understanding, and they'll see they'll see why you know why things are the way they are. And I and I think it is really important that 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 openness is there and the transparency is there, and that parents and family members understand the expectation and know what's required and like it's said up front like it's not something that's hidden or it's not something that like they have to guess at I, I think that that's that is really important and and every coach has their own philosophy when it comes to interacting with parents I know um, you know for me right now mine is you know if a, if a player is upset you know after a game like I won't talk to them about it for like 24 hours like if they're upset at me like they're gonna have to wait we'll cool down and then talk about it the next day because I don't I just don't want to have those conversations same thing with parents you know a parent gets mad at me um at the end of a game which I, doesn't really happen but if that were to happen I'm like mm, we can talk in 24 hours but you know as long as there's a, I think as long as there's a plan in place and that that plan is supported hopefully hopefully that'll be all right and I think you also have the benefit too in that these parents already familiar with the other coach correct like there's kind of a bridge that you already have by having an, that other coach that that is like you said your co-coach with you that can kind of like help and, and almost be a bridge in some cases between what was used to be done and what is being done now yeah, absolutely and, and my thing is i'm not gonna i'm not going in there to upset the apple cart you know <laughs> yeah yeah I, right i i am i am if anything but confident and i think you know 
as, as coaches, you have to be, you have to be competitive and you have to be confident in yourself. Mm-hmm. Yes. I know that right now I'm coming in. I'm still humble though. Right. I'm still not like, I don't know everything. I'm still learning uh, always. Um, but I know that I'm not going to put them in a bad situation. I'm not going to do anything to hurt them. I'm not going to hurt. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to do anything to hurt their development. Um, I know I'm always going to have their best intention at heart. So there are certain things where I just like, I'm not going to deal with certain things from parents and stuff like that. Maybe they might feel more comfortable talking with him and that's perfectly fine. Right. Um, but I don't get that sense right now. I've, I've had some conversations with some of the parents. Of course that could always change. Yeah. Um, and I also have to be mindful being a school coach. I can't just go off and off the cuff and say anything, you know, I'm representing <laughs> the school, you know, I've got to, I've got to have a level head about it. So I do, I do like the policy of waiting until um, after, uh, you know, after the game or whatever. So, and that's something I plan is, you know, Hey, here's my email. Here's everything. Let's set up an appointment. Mm-hmm. So. And well, that's really key that you mentioned that and you're going to take that in your practice because you're not a, you're not a teacher. So like during the day, you're not working at the school in that capacity. And so there's sometimes situations where coaches kind of from the outside almost forget like the school environment and, and what they represent and everything like that. And, you know, just being mindful of like the things that you say and the things that you do are representative of the school. And I think that's really helpful <laughs> that, that you, that you said you're keeping that in mind and you're aware of that. Cause it is easy to forget, you know, it is easy to forget, you know, on a road game or whatever, that's something that you say off the cuff, like, not only represents you, but it, in a sense, it's representing the school and everything like that. And that, that could be a little hard to remember at times in the heat of the moment. <laughs> um, so when it's time to get going, which is hopefully, you know, this fall and this winter, and, and then you can do what you need to do. What are some goals that you have? What are you hoping maybe also on a personal level in terms of your coaching development, but also for your team? What, what are your goals and, and what would you consider to be a job well done um, for the end of year one? Well, I think for me personally, uh, right off the bat, I, I want to gain the trust and respect of the players, um, parents, and, and the administration. Uh, they put a lot of faith in me. Um, as we talked about, it's been a successful program. I'm kind of an unknown entity. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a teacher there. Uh, I'm not a member of their actual community. So they've been really welcoming so far. Um, and I want to, I want to pay that, that back and, and let them know that, you know, I'm passionate about that. I want to share that passion with them. Um, my major goal is to make sure that we're always high energy. Um, that's, that's, that's one of my biggest things is I want to be a big energy. That's, I'm an, I'm that guy. I'm going to be yelling, right? Positively, um, uh, encouraging and everything like that. So I want to make sure that, uh, these girls walk off the court and they always have a, a smile on their face. And I know that's kind of a cheesy goal, but mm-hmm. like, I really, really do want them to enjoy it. Nah, nah, exactly. I could think of something actually was something I've said before, um, in, Again, back to the coach Haskins and what he said. I feel like at this level, if I am their last coach, I have failed. Mm, yeah. So I want to know that all these girls are going to go on, and I have I have a lot of confidence. The ones, especially right now, the eighth graders are going to go on and play high school ball. But I want them to go on and play high school ball. Um, I am actually working on uh, developing my own, I guess, kind of my own metrics and looking at where they're at at the beginning of the season. I'm going to sit down with all the girls and find out what their goals are. I've, I've actually already asked them this, like what's a personal goal for the season? What's a team goal for the season? Let's revisit this at the end of the season. Did you meet your goals? Did the team meet their goals that you wanted them to? Um, so it's kind of like, again, ownership when there. And if they've gotten to reach those goals or getting, or if they, I think that they've gotten better as a player and developed, then I know that that's a successful season for that player and, and then for me as a coach yeah well I, I love I love the conferencing I, I feel like that's becoming more and more either it's more and more popular or I'm just hearing about it more and more is like having those conferences with your players I think like it's a great opportunity to build relationships it's a great opportunity to kind of get the sense of what they want to get out of the 
the program and what they want to get out of the year. And it's probably going to give you some useful information, um, j not just about them in terms of basketball players, but maybe also just as people in general that I think could be super useful as well. Uh, yeah, and, and actually, this is the, a lot of the things that I think we talked about this offline is, uh, so I'm a, I'm a veteran and yep. I am actually an Army employee. I work for an ROTC program at Western Illinois University. And the Army does, you know, constant feedback. So we do, you know, rural sessions where you have counseling sessions. You got to set the standard. You got to let them know when they fall out of line with the standard. And then you got to tell them how they did. Um, yep. And kind of like that, that, that development path. So I'm looking at this as this is the feeder program for the high school. You know, let's have some success while we're here. But let me give, give you some keys, um, developmental goals, markers along the way, so you know you're making progress towards that. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how I will actually measure myself. You know, I guess I'll probably <laughs> measure me. I know there's a lot about wins and losses. Um, and sometimes coaches, they just get measured by that and that alone. I don't think that's what this program is. Um, but I do know there's some level of expectation of success. Right. Whether it's been openly said or not, you can't have 10 years of, of what they've had. <laughs> I can't go, oh, and whatever. And yeah, in, yeah. In three years and just expect to keep the job. Right, right. No. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, wins and losses, they, they don't, they, they're they not as necessarily important at the middle school level. But when you're inheriting a program that is as successful as yours, it probably <laughs> There, there's probably a certain standard of like w what those girls should achieve, especially because you said like there's there's some talent that you have, so um, th there's probably going to be some expectations. But again, it's not like it's the end all be all. Like you better win X amount of games or like you're in trouble or anything. I don't think you're going to be in that situation. It sounds like at all. So, wanna wanna talk about something you mentioned real quick. You mentioned high energy, which I love. I'm, I'm all about that. But what is that? Was that look like for you when you picture like a team playing of high energy on the court what are you imagining what does that look like um very vocal communication number one which i think is some of one of the hardest things to get kids to do uh is to talk um we're going to talk we're going to be loud um so we can hear each other um we're going to encourage our teammates you know somebody makes a great shot somebody makes a block whatever you know, you're clapping it up you're like yeah let's go get it go 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 you know, yeah. really encouraging each other. Um, uh, don't be afraid to uh, play play tough defense. You know, within the realms of the rules. Don't don't go hacking people. Um, um, basically, in in on offense, you know, pushing the ball up the court, uh, trying to play as much transition offense as you can. Um, I know I watched. Uh, there's a really great documentary out there called Res Ball. On Netflix. Oh yeah, absolutely. Arizona, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and that, and it kind of just it blew me away. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You know, this is kind of the tempo. The game has kind of gone this way at all levels, but like the the just amount of of speed that they go at there. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're going to have to consider the players you have. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be speed all the time. You know, you can be crafty and, and still have our energy but there's just so many things going into it i think the number one thing is very vocal communication um and, and very very loud encouragement you know um confidence is important and i want my girls to be confident uh maybe they might be perceived as cocky by some people um mm -hmm. i don't want to get into to the realm of bad sportsmanship yeah but you know, uh, i'm probably not going to to get too heated if somebody leaves their hand up a little bit long after they hit a three, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that's, I just say that's good form. <laughs> yeah, yeah, watching it go Obviously in. You gotta, be, you, you gotta be with them respect, but I, I just wanna, I, I want them to really, really be, really enjoy the game. And I think that that's what leads to the high energy too, is that they're enjoying themselves. Yeah, yeah, it kind of feeds off itself, you know, and when the energy is coming and builds on itself and then there's just more and more and then you you just have a, really loud gym hopefully at that point once it starts building building on itself absolutely now you've touched on it uh in a couple different ways but i want to make sure that that i'm being intentional of this question um 
there are for any new job that you take there are going to be some barriers or there are going to be things that you know you're going to have to overcome and, and it's great because you need to be aware of what those are and then you know try and make a plan to overcome those um what are some situations or things that you think might be coming up this year that are maybe going to be some barriers that you're going to have to overcome along the way um well there's i alluded to there's there's limited number of girls at the eighth grade level um i think i've yeah. right now projected there's four or five coming back um there are some really stellar seventh graders that are coming up um the, the the stud player of the program is a seventh grader. I actually got a chance to go watch her play AAU, and I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not gonna. I don't think we're gonna have the numbers to really press a lot. Um, so if we get against a team that is just killing us, um, it's gonna be kind of hard to to change the um, change the tempo. Um, it's gonna be hard to change like the momentum because sometimes throwing a press, throwing in a different defense at them. Um, that can make things, that can change things in your favor. Um, I don't really know how well it's going to work. Um, and it's going to, this is going to be a learning curve for me. But talking with the coaches is like, I have an idea of like, I want to throw this press into this defense. Um, so it falls back a little easier. Yeah. So I go in like a one, two, two press and then falling into a one, three, one, which I thought words would never come out of my mouth because I've, <laughs> kind of a, I've never really liked the one, three, one, but watching some film and going out and doing some research, I see where it can be applied in certain situations mm -hmm. correctly with more trapping and things like that. Um, but it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard to get there. So um, there's some decent size, that they have, uh, but again, until I really see the competition and everything and, and know who's doing what, um, it's gonna be hard, kind of hard to to do that. Um, again, the other coach that I have that's with me will have some of that information about, hey, we're gonna have to press, we're gonna have to watch this girl, we're gonna have to do that. Um, so that's gonna be helpful. Um, and I think, you know, obviously you're coming up with, uh, right now the barriers, uh, uh that we have school wise mm -hmm. um you know are there going to there's going to be somebody that's going to become ineligible or yeah there's going to be somebody that's going to you know get hurt and things like this and with low numbers you always kind of worry about that right um, and uh that's something else too is kind of go back to where we talk about goals that there's this program is so good why do i have such low numbers um at the eighth grade level, you know, yeah. what, 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 what's, what's, what's that, what's that about, you know, uh, what can I do to make it, to make it better? So, um, that's just kind of some of the things I've thought about, but again, until I get into it, I'm, uh -huh. I'm right. So it's this is the, this is the basketball teachers podcast, but so I'm a basketball learner. <laughs> So I can ask you, so what's, what, what do you think as a barrier, as a first time scholastic coach, I'm going to come up against? Uh, well, the, the biggest one in your particular situation, I think is going to be that you don't work at the school. And I think that there, there's a couple of things that are going to have to be overcome. Number one, it may be a little difficult for you to find out why you're not getting girls. Uh, one of my best players who I had in middle school, I, I picked her out of PE class when I was in my prep period. And so that I, I had some insight and advantage that way and that I was around and that I was available and I could kind of see what was going on at the school. And so that might be something you're gonna have to see if you can get like some inside information. Does your does your other coach, does he work in the school? I'm sorry if you mentioned this already. Uh, and I he's, actually a, he's actually a small business owner in the area. Okay. So he does not, he does not to work, but he is connected with the with the with the program through like the travel program, which is something I'm hoping to also get involved with to maybe help help with that side of it. Right. So that that might be that might be useful too to to kind of just get a sense of like in the school like is is there a reason why there are low numbers? You know, I I don't I don't know what the situation is or how big your school is, but you know, it, it seems to me that a team that like yours at unity that's been really successful that you should have a lot of numbers and i'm curious and this will be something you're going to be able to find out if 
some girls at the school like just feel intimidated like they they see how successful like the program is and they don't even want to try out they don't even want to bother because they just like don't even feel like they're even going to be good enough to even be considered to be on the team you know what i'm saying that's right, something yeah. I'm yeah so that that'd be something i'd be curious about and then well, and then the other thing too, and, and you alluded to it, is that you just don't know until you play that first couple games. Like you don't know if you know this press is going to work, or you don't you don't know if this, that, or the other is going to work. And a, a few coaches that I've talked to have, have said this: one of the hardest things is going to be if you start in in a new program and you have this system that you want to put in place, and it's not being successful. You know, the first couple of games is do you still believe enough in that system that this is going to work and you just have to stick through it? Or if you think that there's something inherently wrong with the system that needs to be changed, um, it's just one of those challenges where we don't want to throw away everything that we've done and we want to stick to what we believe in, but then also understanding like, is this what we believe in or are we just being stubborn about it? I think is going to be just be something that every coach faces because you just don't know until you play those first couple of games, whether or not the whole system you put in place, uh, whether it's working and it will work or whether it's just completely falling apart. Right. And that's one of my concerns too, actually, that I'm glad you said that because I, you know, I definitely have things I believe in. I, I think this will work. I've, I've seen this work in different applications. Um, but then will it work with these, with this personnel? Um, and am I, you always have to kind of put your ego aside. It's fun to kind of learn because you got to be willing to say, okay, I don't know everything, but does it look bad if you completely scrap everything like this guy doesn't have any idea what he's doing? Mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do think I've put, I've put an immense amount of time into this, um, you know, personal time, money, uh, you know, the time away from the family, uh, things like that, researching, learning to get to this point. And it's, and I, I I'm so enthused by this, you know, I'm, I'm like sitting here jittery, like thinking about, about <laughs> um, me too. But coach. yeah. So, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to like, just like blow it. I don't want to blow the shot. So it's kind of kind of nerve wracking, but you know what, if it's for the betterment of the girls and for the team as a whole, I think you just have to kind of bite that bullet, so to say, mm. and, and do what needs to happen. And then I would reach out to, at that point, I would reach out to the high school coach and I would talk to the other coach and be like, Hey, what do you think we should do? let's institute something else if it's going to work. So. Well, yeah, that, that's a great mindset to have. I think you, you want to have your, like you said, you want to have your philosophy. You want to have the things that you believe in, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you're not, like you said, you're not their, their last coach and that you're putting them in a position to be successful in high school. So if you kind of work that into what you're doing, like this is what I believe in, but also here's what they're doing at the high school level. So I know if you're doing this, and you're going to learn how to do this and be successful at this, then you're going to have a much smoother transition once you get into high school. So I'm hoping that the high school coach and you are going to have some shared ideas and shared philosophy so that you don't feel like you have to, you know, radically change who you are just to conform so that they're going to be more successful in high school. I'm hoping that's not the case for you. It doesn't seem so, so far. I've, I've talked with him. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to be, he's like, this is your team. Yeah. This is okay. Yeah. And and that that that's a good that's a good relationship I think to have where you know as a high school coach you'd be like this is what I do but you're the coach of this team and just don't want you to feel like you're going to have to be a, a clone of me necessarily especially because as a high school coach you know high school coaching philosophies change and beliefs change and so you know, you don't want to be too rigid. And then all of a sudden the high school coach is like, well, you know, I scrapped this and I'm doing something completely different now. So sorry. <laughs> so I think it is good to, that you have your own voice and that you have your own um, belief system that you adhere to so that, you know, you're authentic to yourself and the players see that authenticity as well. Exactly. So this is great. And, 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 I, and I definitely am looking forward to, again, fingers crossed, I'm looking forward to revisiting this once you get going to kind of follow up and talk about some of these things and, and see how things are going and see what you've learned along the way. So I'm really excited for that. Now, to wrap up, um, I know that you still have experience coaching, so I can still ask this question uh, from, from your experience coaching. What is a coaching moment of yours that you think others listening would be able to learn from? Um, 
I think the first time I coached my daughter's team, um, the, the very first games, uh, we were kind of limited on practice. It was a travel ball team, but I still wanted them to be successful. You know, um, it's definitely about learning and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of alluded to it too earlier. I got so wrapped up in those tactics that I overlooked some of the fundamental stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think it was, and, and, and I felt kind of like, I felt kind of embarrassed about it, not because of how bad the games went, because they went bad. Um, and I felt like I failed my girls because all the time that I'd spent researching and stuff, all those lessons, like I alluded to again, USA basketball, um, the development, all the, all the time I spent reading um, and everything like this. But then I saw flashes of what, what some of these girls could do. And I just like over romanticized the moment. Uh huh. Um, I thought we're going to set this screen and we're going to do that. And we're going to do this pick and roll and, 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 uh, and we're going to, you know, just get into this. And it was, it was a little bit above their heads on some level. Um, they were getting some of it. Um, but I, I was so wrapped up into this is the way I want to do things. This is the tactics that I didn't spend enough time just teaching them how to dribble. These were first time players and, you know, uh, and, and I think you can get so wrapped up in that, um, that, that I've, I learned a very valuable lesson about that. So no matter what level you're at, you have to dedicate, um, a good amount of time to your skill development. Um, and of course the younger they are, the, the more, uh, important, the very fundamentals, the pillars of basketball, dribbling, shooting, passing, uh, and of course defense. Uh, but especially if you can dribble, pass, and shoot, there's a place for you on a court. Yeah. Um, to me, defense is about effort more than anything. There's some positioning and everything like this, but you got to teach your kids to pass, dribble, and shoot, and, and then teach them effort. That's the way I look at it. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I think so many coaches, I think almost every coach I will t <laughs> that I talk to will tell you that they need more skill work. They need more time shooting and dribbling and passing and doing all of those skill-based things. And you're right, it's so easy to get caught up in wanting to diagram these plays and get into your schematics because we do spend so much time, you know, learning the game and, and learning all these different things that I think we can get to the point where we're making it too complicated and we, we're going to make the game way too complicated where it's just like, wait a minute, instead of focusing on all these schematic things, let's just make sure that they're, they're dribbling right and shooting right because at the end of the day, we can draw up all the plays we want in the world, but if our players don't have those skills, they're, they're not going to be executing them anyway those those great plays that we uh develop and design i, I think i to one really big example about the whole thing this can sum that all that all that experience is up is um i saw i was watching some old world cup basketball games and i was watching uh fiba like it was spain playing and there was this really cool staggered um uh like wheel action inbounds play that they did for a three and i modified it um, for an easy layup. And then I try to institute that with third and fourth graders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been like the, the second best, like, uh, international team in the world. And I try to take one of their complicated game plays for a three and, and throw it in there. Uh, that was, they, they looked at me bewildered and I wanted, I was trying it for like four practices and I said, okay, we're done. Box set, <laughs> cross and, and dive down to the hoop. That's yeah. It. So, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's so common though. It's so common for everybody that we hear um, about like these great plays and these great things that we see. And, you know, my, my joke is always, you know, I, I, I see some things that like the Yukon women can run and I'm like, man, like, okay, I, look how great it looks. I can do this. And then, <laughs> well, I, you know, I said, I love my girls, but I, I don't coach the Yukon women's team. So um, <laughs> that, that high post dump down to the bottom stuff that they do. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I fantasize about, having a team that can do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah. And, and so it, it's good to know where your players are at, meet them where they are and understanding what's going to be best for them, whether it's your high school, whether it's elementary age, just making sure that you're being, being honest with yourselves and, and just putting them in positions to be successful. I, I, I absolutely hundred percent agree with that philosophy. Well, what I want to do, like I do with everybody is mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I give you your 60 second soapbox to talk about, 
Anything that's on your mind, any, any closing thought, any final thought, anything that you didn't get to or just want to reemphasize, the floor is yours, Coach. Go ahead. Um, so I guess this is, this is as much for some coaches, but it's more along the lines of, of schools and parents and everything like this. Uh, it's about girls' sports. So I don't care if, you're, if your girls play basketball or volleyball or field hockey or soccer or whatever it is. Encourage your daughters to play sports. Um, it's a national trend where participation is down overall, um, but especially among younger females. Uh, I know a lot of them won't play past high school, but they can gain so much from, from being a part of a team by giving them positive role models. Um, there are numerous studies that are out there um, that just show what a positive role that sports can play in a woman's life in confidence. Um, and they're less likely to, to, you know, fall into a bad crowd with every kid is. Uh, but I've seen so many times with schools where they just don't care about girls' sports. Uh, and it kind of angers me. Um, and don't just encourage them, be their fan. Um, whether you're their coach or whether you're a parent, uh, be their fan. Give them the same kind of energy for the girls' volleyball team that you would for the football team. Um, girls are athletes. Girls are badasses, right? <laughs> Give them a chance to show what they can do. Yes. I, as a girls coach, you're speaking to me. Absolutely. I advocate for girls sports, uh, champion girls sports, and then, again, just treat them as athletes. Treat them as, as you would any other athlete, regardless of gender, uh, Absolutely. Like that's speaking right to me and, and, and speaking to a lot of coaches I know who listen to this and who I've talked to who are girls coaches that uh, coaching girls, it's, it's great. And it's, it's a, such a unique and fun experience and that we need to advocate and, and be that voice for, for our girls to make sure that the game is growing and, and it's going the right direction. So thank you very much for mentioning that. That, that speaks to me personally. So, uh, Thank you again. We're, we're going to be in touch because, like I said, my goal is to chrono, kind of chronologically go through and document your journey, hopefully that it happens this year, and uh, check in with you and just see how things are going. And like I said, for the veteran coaches to sort of reflect on what it was like when it was their first year to take a program, and then for our newer coaches to kind of go along uh, with this, go along on this journey with you. So thank you for, for opening up about what your plan is, and thank you for, for being so open and honest about it. And I'm really excited to check in with you later in the year and uh, Good luck with everything so far. All right, thanks, Coach. I appreciate it. No problem. I'm really looking forward to staying in touch and seeing where this journey takes you this year. So thank you guys for listening. This was another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. We will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.